Well, the book is titled Online Classes at Work, Discovering the Secrets to Teaching Online. Uh, I think the key premise of um, the book is that a lot of people teach online but don't really get the classes set up right. Um, it's really critical that the classes in an online environment be set up and structured right up front. You have to put the time in up front to do that. So really the book is a result of my studies of what makes an online class truly effective. Why do some work and why don't some work was sort of my research question when I started the book. And what I set out to do was figure out what, what makes them work, uh, what you need to do, the little things that you need to do to make a class work. Um, but, but a lot of things are really to make sure you create content. On one hand, it really is focused on the online classroom. And in an online classroom, you have an opportunity to bring in resources from lots and lots of different places. Um, it's important that the instructor who creates that curates that information. He doesn't just, he or she doesn't just randomly bring it together and say, oh, here's a YouTube video, here's this, here's that. He really goes to the effort to create that information and bring it together in a cohesive fashion like it's, um, like it's designed for the class. The second piece would be that you want to take, when you take that information, you want to take that and, and make sure that any new content you bring into that class is really truly content designed for an online classroom. It, it's not designed, it wasn't a recording of your lecture to the lecture hall and hey, we'll just play it for you and you can learn from my lecture because that doesn't work. You want the students to feel that, it, you want the students to buy in because it was designed specifically for them and you want to spend the time to actually design something for the online classroom which means certain different technology deliveries. You can't just stand up in front of the room and lecture to an online classroom. They're not going to listen to you. They have an attention span of five minutes, ten minutes on a video. Um, you need to have activities that are, you need to have content in the classroom that's active that asks students to go do something. Go explore something, go find something, go interview somebody, go talk to somebody, go solve a problem, go do something that's active. And once you do that activity, go talk to people about that activity through your discussions. Um, you don't want to ask discussion questions that are technical. Uh, very often, you know, you put a technical question, what would are the five key points in chapter five? Well, what's the first student answers and the second student answers? That's pretty much it. Um, so you want to take, okay, well, let's take the five key points in chapter five, and uh, which one do you feel is the most important? Um, can you take one of those um, points and, and apply it in your place of business? How would that have related to you in your life? What if we had these points, which one do you think is the most important to solving this particular problem? Something like that, where you ask, actually ask them to take the, the material. And the catch is with the material to make them actively read the material. If I just ask you to recite it, you recite it, you forget it. If I ask you to read the material, then you have to say, okay, now which one is important? Let me think about that for a moment. And you, and you sit there and say, okay, well, I think the fourth one is really important. Let me take that fourth point and write about it. At that point, you understand what that material is. You, you, you've now written about that point. You truly understand what that material is. So you've actively engaged the learner in the process. Um, the other thing you really want to do is make sure that you've structured the class in such a way that the students come back to the classroom. I mean, big problem, I can go to Facebook, I can go to LinkedIn, Twitter, that type of thing. Um, I, can go to the, I can go to those particular sources, and I go to those places frequently because there's constantly new material. Um, the online classroom needs to be structured in a way where there's an incentive for me as a student to go through that class multiple times during a particular period, let's say I have a weekly session. If there's nothing new, I go once. If there's going to be something new, if the professor's posting things on Tuesday, oh, I'll go back and see what the professor had to say. Oh, if my colleagues are posting things here. You, you want the people to be actively engaged and constantly coming back because it's like Facebook, there's new material. You, you need constantly engaging content to bring them through, which you can structure into a class. Transferable, the content's transferable, the presentation and, 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 and how it's presented in the online classroom needs to be well thought out. Um, it's really question taking instructional designers can help you do that just in terms of how it's presented. Um, it's important I think for the instructor to understand a little bit about how the online classroom works and what the students are doing and sort of look at how and to think about how they interact online, what they do online, um, what they would find boring, what they would find interesting. And then if you couple that with the lesson of talk to some people about what my, how my book came about, let's talk to some people about how things might work. Talk to people, talk to the instructional designers, talk to others about what they've done to bring those students into the conversation. Um, that's really critical. And then the other element that I, I really think is 
to make sure that the students understand the rules and, it, and agree to adhere to the rules and it, that you adhere to the rules as well. If you've committed to grade papers by Tuesday, you grade papers by Tuesday. If you commit to respond to phone calls by you know, 24 hours, respond to phone calls for 24 hours and things like that. So it, it, it's critical to do that. But, but it's, it's, you have the material, you're the content expert, all you're doing is presenting it in a different way. It, it's like being a, you know, you can, present a, you can present your material as a lecture, you can present your material as a book. If you had uh, somebody come up to you and said, you want to make a documentary, you could present your material as a documentary. The, all three would convey the message. You're the same person, you're interviewing me here and I'm presenting it verbally instead of in the written word. Um, but that's basically the way you do it. It's really critical to get your hands around and figure out how the best way to present it. And there's lots of people that colleges have generally that can help you do that. The first thing I would say was make sure you understand your class. Um, a teacher who comes in the first time, you know, typically will get hired at very short notice and will have the opportunity to teach a class that's all prepared for them, but isn't, in fact. Uh, that's very typical. Is we'll tell you the class is ready, and you'll discover that it's about 80% complete, and the other pieces kind of got left by the prior instructor. Because that's reasonably typical with a class. That's typical with any class, but it's, it it shows up online. Um, so, so you have to make sure your class is set up. You just have to make sure you spend the time to understand what's in the class and where it's going, the direction of it. Um, and, and that means a little bit more than just looking at the syllabus. It means really dealing with the in-depth content of, of week five or something like that. Um, so you have to certainly be a couple weeks ahead of the students in your classroom. That, that would be a key piece of advice. Um, the next piece of advice is really to make sure you're monitoring what's going on and trying to figure out if the students are in fact engaged or if they're passive. They're, they're doing assignments because the assignment is due, but they're not really engaged. Um, and if they're not really engaged, you as an instructor have to make sure you go back and say, okay, how do I get these guys involved? Um, in my book, I talk about an example of a, a, an economics professor who truly engaged um, you know, his students in, a, in his traditional classroom and felt totally overwhelmed by the students in the online classroom. Um, and, it, and it was because of the way the class was structured. It didn't ask engaging questions. It didn't ask questions that would allow you to have a conversation. So if you're finding that, the, you know, if you're finding um, th that students aren't engaged, take a look at what you're asking them to do and see if you're asking them to recite or if you're asking them to engage. Are you asking them to think or are you asking them to repeat? If you're asking them to repeat, it's not going to work. Or are you giving them questions that, that gives them a chance to talk? Yeah, the, the first secret that we, we talked about that I presented in the session was the technology is really secondary. I mean, to deliver an online class, it really depends on the course structure and the facilitation. And I think that's really what people are seeking. That's sort of the, the hidden technology, that's the hidden detail. Um, I can integrate all the technology in the world. I can, you know, give you the latest, greatest computers, latest, greatest servers, latest, greatest learners management system. I can integrate this, I can have this software, I can have that software. How am I using it? Does the instructor understand how to bring the student into that process. And it's, it's no different than really trying to bring somebody into a, a conversation. It's not all perfect. I think everybody's learning. Everybody learns every time. Because by the time you, you know, it may, it may take five years, 10 years, 20 years to acquire the knowledge. And then it, you have to acquire new knowledge. It's the same thing as, as, as working in a classroom. If you're, if you're working in a classroom, working in a church or something like that, you know, you give a, the, 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 the minister or priest or something gives a speech, gives his, gives his sermon one day, it doesn't go over big. Next time he adjusts the sermon based on what he learned about this congregation that day, next time he does it a little bit differently. The, the teacher brings a classroom in, they, they, they bring this information together. If they kept doing that five years from now, those students are different. Those students have had a different experience. I mean, one of the hard things that we see is that your students come in with different experiences. You know, I, I, you can see that I'm old. You know, I grew up without computers and iPads and things like that. Students now have grown up with cell phones. Students now grow up with iPads. St students now, uh, children now touch a, a, you know, a picture screen and expect it to move to other pictures like you do on an iPad. So you have to constantly revise what you're doing no matter where you're doing it. Um, and the technology is a tool, but it's not, it's not the only tool. The tool is, is the, the, the the knowledge, the instructor, the facilitator's knowledge, the designer's knowledge, the program head's knowledge to say, we need to be able to take this information that we're getting and use it in a way that can help us educate the students. My last point in the presentation was let the teachers teach. The teachers are experts. You have to let those teachers take their knowledge, what they learned from doing the class once, 
and apply it to teaching it the second time, applying it to teach it the third time, applying it to dealing with that difficult student. They have to be able to improvise, perhaps, use their skills and experience. They're, they're artists, they're not technicians. And, and I think that everyone that thinks it's perfect is treating it like a technician. If you treat it like a technician, you're going to discover that very quickly you're going to have an out-of-date product. Well, there's two ways to do it. One is to set aside time to work on it. Um, so in other words, you work on it. At, you know, I tend to work on the course material early in the morning and perhaps late in the day and, and tend to, sh if you will, shut off um, all email. You know, not shut, shut it off completely, but don't deal with the nuances, that, the, the annoyances that, that come up. Um, you know, a student, that, you shouldn't encourage your students to ask questions early rather than later. The student asking questions five minutes before the assignment is due at 11 o'clock on Sunday night is not going to get an answer um, because, you know, the instructor needs some downtime too. So, so you want to structure it in a way that you manage your time. Uh, but the second thing is to, if you stay and monitor what, what's happening with the class. So if, if, if one student asks a question about a clarification to an assignment and you say, oh my goodness, yes, I can see how you might not understand that. So then you take the answer to that question and you post it to the class and say, hey, John just asked this really interesting question about this. The assignment may not be as clear as I thought it was. This is what I mean. And you post that answer to the class. So you've perhaps knocked off two or three other people who might have had that question. I mean, I think that's critical to understand. If, if I ask that question, they're not just, it's not just one student, it's probably many students. And I need to present the answer to many students. In the classroom, I present the answer to many students. In the online classroom, I present it one-on-one. -on -one. If I present it one-on-one -on -one four times, that doesn't help the remaining, the remaining students. I mean, the basics of learning management systems are constantly evolving. Um, I mean, they're better than they were a few years ago. Some of the, the major ones are worse than they are a few years ago. I, think, I, I personally think a lot of learning management systems have lousy reporting capabilities as an instructor. I can't monitor what I really want to monitor. I can't yet do that. And I'm an old systems guy, so I said, well, if you just could write a report that would monitor this, that would be really good, but they don't get there. Um, so, I th so I think that learning management systems constantly evolve, and there's two or three of them that are, that are, that are, hi that are highly you know, valuable and they're, they're, they're the usual culprits. Um, I think that's important that you have you know, decent, decent delivery with that. Um, the, the, the other thing, I think, with the tools is just to constantly be on the lookout for a new tool to do something. You don't have to be on the forefront. You don't have to be the first person to use a product, but you have to understand that that tool you used six months ago doesn't necessarily work anymore. Um, you know, I'm big on, you know, I, I will record in my office. On, I have a Mac and I have a Mac with a, a camera in it and I use a couple features of, of that. And it's really simple to just sit there and record a quick video. It takes five minutes to record the video. Um, you know, I've learned over time how to manipulate the video and things like that to make it work better, but that's not necessary because a lot of times it's just the simple, simple tools, they're after information. They're used to reading, watching bad videos on, on YouTube or something like that. They're after the information, they're, they want it humanized, they want to know you're a human. And, and I think that's really important with the class. As long as they think the instructor is a human, which you can humanize yourself with a video, with an audio, with audio comments to the student. Hey, John, this is what's, what's wrong with this. I understand what you're trying to do, but you really need to go a different direction with it. Consider this particular point. They'll go, oh, okay, as opposed to saying, well, you're just wrong. I mean, it's just simple things like communication. It's the humanizing tools, which are, you, yeah, you get to do them electronically instead of in person, but it, it's the same results.